Hello viewers, welcome to our program on immigration and you. I am your immigration attorney Michael Fulwani and once again we are with us attorney David Nachman, my partner. David, welcome. Thanks so much Michael. Always a pleasure to be here. Shortly, Thanks. David is going to go to India uh, with a group of uh, immigration lawyers and I'm going to ask David to give you all the information about his trip and then some other announcement he has to make about the film festival. We'll do uh, it real quick. Good. So first of all, um, as I mentioned uh, in one of our previous programs, uh, I'm going to be uh, traveling to India in early November and we're going to be uh, traveling to several major cities. Um, of course, New Delhi, Chennai, um, also to Goa and to Mumbai. And if any of you or your family members are interested in having a meeting in India, please feel free to reach out for us and we'll be more than happy to set that up. And uh, with that, I'm, as Michael mentioned, we're going to be traveling with a delegation of other attorneys, uh, so it should be very interesting. We, of course, will be visiting the consulates in, um, in New Delhi, in Mumbai, and in uh, Chennai. So I hope to be able to bring you a lot of really great information when I return. Also, I wanted to just mention the Teaneck International Film Festival, which we've mentioned in the past, and that is that we'll be showing, uh, we will actually, NPZ Law Group will be sponsoring a movie called English of English. Many of you have seen it, some of you haven't. It's a great movie, and it'll be on November 17th at the Teaneck Cinemas in the afternoon. And uh, please feel free to join us. Uh, again, NPZ will be sponsoring that, and there'll be a representative of Eros Films there that day to uh, talk a little bit about the uh, movie. And so, one of the agents who were responsible and for of, arranging all that's that. That's right, and one of the agents will also be there. Yeah, Very good. Great. Very nice. One topic that comes to us all the time, a guy went through a lot of hurdles, waiting periods, finally, finally gets a green card. Now he's looking at a U.S. passport, which can be happen only when he becomes a U.S. citizen. So today's program, let us talk about the requirements, eligibility to become a U.S. citizen. What are the requirements about physical residency, about travel abroad for long periods of time, the problems that come generally, good moral character is one of the issues, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, some other criminal crimes sometimes, small crimes may not be a big problem, bigger Another crimes issue. could be a problem. Yeah. So these are all the, and some people that do not know the English language may be exempt. David, give our viewers all this information so that they understand. First, first part is who is eligible? What are the requirements? Well, I think that um, the most important thing, I guess, is for everyone to understand, which, Michael, you just pointed out, is that really the ultimate road that everyone takes in the immigration process, which usually starts out with a non-immigrant visa, like a student visa or an H-1B, uh, ultimately goes then to green card and then with the hope that an individual will become a citizen and that is that they'll be able to get a U.S. passport. So uh, what are the requirements? Well, the first requirement, most important requirement, is that the individual is 18 years of age or older, and that individual can apply then for a U.S. passport, uh, can apply for citizenship and get a U.S. passport. Now, there are also a group of people in the United States um, who can apply for what's called the Child Citizenship Act. So what it is is that they've um, acquired their citizenship before the age of 18 where a parent has become a citizen. And what uh, happens then is that those individuals, once the parent becomes a citizen, can just go and apply automatically right to the passport office for a U.S. passport. Yeah. So, Are the child born abroad to a U.S. citizen? There are some requirements of residency and all that. But that's another way people don't realize the person is born in India, how can he be a U.S. citizen? Yeah, his father or mother are U.S. citizen, <clears throat> and if they made those residency requirements, then also they are considered as U.S. citizens. That's right, and that's a filing, Michael, that's done at the U.S. consulate abroad, where there are consular officials who can assist individuals who are making those applications to ensure that they meet those requirements. As a matter of fact, I know some people go and apply for a, for a visa at the American consulate, and the consular looks at the papers, and he says, what are you well, doing? You were Why? born in India, That's but right. your father was there. Yeah. And then the consul says, I think you are eligible for a U.S. citizen. Just apply for a U.S. passport. Exactly. You got a big surprise. Oh, my God. I'm That's already right. a U.S. citizen? So that's, That's right. that. let's go back now to the naturalization. Now, these are the people who are born in the U.S. They are citizens by birth. Or who are right. born abroad to the U.S. parents, citizen by birth. Right. And those people, 
are here on a green card holder, maintaining their green card status, Correct. and now want to become U.S. citizens, file a form N-400, what we call. That's right. It's an N-400 what, form. What right. are the eligibility requirements? I, as I mentioned briefly, let's give a little more information. Sure. Well, on first, the physical residence, for example. Okay. So the physical residence, the physical residence requirement in the United States is depends upon the methodology that you're using by which you're applying for naturalization. So the first thing that you need to look at is whether or not you're applying for naturalization based off of a, uh, an immediate relative family petition where it's marriage to a U.S. citizen. In that case, uh, as everyone knows, you can go to citizenship in three years and you need to prove... Three years from the date of the green card issue. Three years from the date of the green card issue, exactly. So it's 90 days prior to the third anniversary. So what you have to do is you have to be physically present in the United States for at least one half of that period of time. So what you do is you take 365 days, you uh, add that, uh, you multiply that by three, and you divide, and then you divide it, and you have the amount of time that you need to have been physically present in the, the United others, States. And the others, others is five years. Right? For other, right, exactly. So for the other categories, if you um, received your green card through. Uh, one of the other family categories or through an employment category, it's five years, so 90, day, 90 days prior to the fifth anniversary, you can go ahead and apply for citizenship, and then it's one half of that five years, which I believe is something like 912.5 so days or something. 30 months like, in, the, in the... Exactly, uh, exactly. So the issues no, come also, in... Also, that one other thing, yeah. mm -hmm. that it also requires a continuous maintaining the permanent resident status. In that context, Right. It's advisable very strongly that do not remain outside of the U.S. for more than six months. Now, that doesn't mean if you have stayed for more than six months, you are ineligible, but that is a red light. That raises a question. If you remain outside of the U.S. for more than six months and you are unable to explain the reasons why you remained, they can say, by remaining outside for more than six months, you have abandoned your permanent resident status. That's right. That's, and it happens yeah. a lot in the case of mm -hmm. parents, elderly, that they, they say, oh, I have one year to go back. So That's first right. of all, they will not be able to meet the half anyway. Right. But even if they meet, let us say they stay the full year, in one year, another year, eight months, that eight-month period then that will raise that issue. So uh, recommend right. yeah. And where does that issue come up, Michael? It comes up when the individual is entering the United States and they uh, use their green card as a re-entry permit. The officer who is at CBP at the kiosk will say, well, how long have you been outside the United States? And the person says, let's say, well, I've been there eight months. The officer will say, well, why have you been there for eight months? That's a long time. We think that you've relinquished your lawful permanent resident status. So what we generally recommend to our clients is have some evidence of the fact that you've continued to maintain your lawful permanent resident status in the U.S. Because it's not that you automatically lose your lawful permanent residence. What it is is that a presumption has been raised, like Michael said. Correct. There has to be... So, so, so what do you do to overcome the officer's presumption? Well, what you can do is, one, you can show that you're filing taxes in the United States. So if you're filing income taxes, not non-immigrant income taxes, but immigrant, uh, normal, you know, 1040s. There's also reasons, important. Why did you remain for more than six months out? Exactly. So a student, okay, I'm going to school there. Right. Person got sick, he was in a hospital. Maybe there's a family member who's ill. The, the so we'll, have a family yeah, member, so we'll he say couldn't carry come back. the medical records. For yeah, the, so, yeah. so that is something that we look into that. Also, one other point is that very important is a client comes in, he says, I heard Mr. David Nachman and you, and whatever you said, we meet all these requirements. Only one thing is there, that in one of the years, I went for more than a year on a re-entry permit. But otherwise, I meet, if you put the total number of years. Right. If ever that happens, even if you have a re-entry permit, and your green card is that way, in that context, valid. Under the law, that rule changes of the five years. Under that law, if he entered on a re-entry permit after one year from the departure, he has to wait four years and one day before he can apply for citizenship. And people That's don't right. realize that. Actually, in the re-entry permit, in the instructions, it says very clearly. It says, right. So it warns the people that if you stay more than a year out, 
then you will lose the previous. And I think it's really important, Michael, for us to point out to our viewers what the reentry permit is. That's a separate application. It's done on an I-131, where what you're essentially doing is making a declaration to the U.S. government that you intend not to relinquish your lawful permanent residence. So if it's your feeling in any way, shape, or form that you're not going to come back in within that six-month period, it might be a great idea for you to apply for a reentry permit before you come back to the United States. What about the requirement of English language? Well, there is, of course, is an English language requirement. And uh, when the individual, after they've submitted the N-400, they're going to get notified for an interview. And then at that interview, they'll be tested on their English language. So the first part of that test, the officer, of course, is asking the individual questions. So if they notice that the individual doesn't understand what they're being asked, they know that there's a problem. Or but then says, there's also a written test. Or he says, Sir, I want an interpreter. Right. Well, that doesn't work in all cases. However, there are certain exemptions from the rules for naturalization where if you have been a lawful permanent resident for a certain number of years and you are a certain age, then you are actually exempt from these requirements. My recollection is if you are green card holder for more than 15 years, it's the residency of the, more than 15 years, if you are a green card holder for more than 15 years, and you are uh, under the age of, um, I think, 65? 55. 55? 55? Probably, yeah. yeah. Okay, there may be an exemption. Or if you are more than 20 years and age is uh, 50, something like that, there's a combination of the uh, yeah. residency and the whole long year of a green card. I'm just saying right. from my memory. But the most, the most but important those requirements, yeah. if somebody meets, then is exempted exemption, from right. the English test. But it's still, test will be there. A That's Gujarati right. is a good, let's say, they will ask him Gujarati That's questions right. about the civics and about the history and all other questions, that, but that is still remains it. Now, right. there are well, let's talk quickly about the civics exam so that our viewers understand right. that the information regarding the civics exam is all available online at www.uscis.gov, and there's actually a naturalization module that you can take a look at. We also have a great deal of information on the NPZ uh, law website at www.visaserve.com and you can feel free to take a look at that information and use it to prepare for your test. What about the, the, the exemption based upon disability? Person is blind, person right. cannot hear. That's a great they question, for dumb and, and he, 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 that's the problem, physical or mental problem. Well, I'm really glad that you asked that because I had several inquiries just this week about what's called the disability waiver, the N-648. And the N-648 form is a, uh, an application that accompanies the N-400 when it's made. And it has to do with whether or not a person is, uh, has some kind of a mental or physical disability that would not enable them to uh, be able to qualify for naturalization. And so obviously, uh, you would want to get a doctor's report and have some kind of a link between the physical ailment and the ability of the person to learn. Actually speaking, that form has to be completed, that part of the form, by the, doctor. By the medical doctor That's himself. Correct. And he has to identify himself as uh, whatever the number is, registration number, exactly, his specialty, yeah. and be a little more detailed. He cannot say, oh, he cannot speak English or read. And why not? Why can't he learn, read, uh, or English? Why cannot he learn it? Right. Question is because he's there has blind. has to be a clear link. Because, yeah, yeah. So it's a clear link, connection directly between that uh, mental or a physical disability and the ability to learn and speak uh, right English. That's right. And just by way of an example, Michael, for clarification for our viewers, one of the uh, disability claims that we made several years back was we had an individual who had diabetes. And what we were able to do, uh, she was actually, uh, uh, she had, she was higher up in age. And what we did is we argued that because of the diabetes, there was decreased blood flow to her brain. And as a result of that, the doctor said she had the inability to learn. So, so the English language is like read, write, and speak. Exactly. With All that, three. we have That's right. to conclude our today's program. We are running out of the time. Interesting program, though for those especially who are looking forward to become US citizens. But there are more issues to this topic. And hopefully, we can talk a little bit more about in the next program. So make sure to watch our next program next Saturday and Sunday only on ITV and Vision Aviation. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thanks so much, Michael.